Okay, thank you for tuning in to Stampscaping 101. I just did a pretty simple composition. I wanted to do something with a dark silhouette against a night sky. Going with a real crisp impression of the eagle stamp, um, stamped in front of my source of light. In this case, it's a full moon. Um, you know, it's all, there's always the composition within any kind of scenic stamping, but the thing that I was trying to go for more than anything was the kind of contrast of a really soft light against um, the foreground of, uh, in this case, the subject matter, which is the eagle. I don't know. I don't know if it's a subject matter, but it's definitely the focal point in the scene. So getting that uh, kind of that glowing orb look in the scene and uh, reinforcing the idea of that as a light source by bringing in some uh, uh, pigment ink and uh, white uh, gel pen dots over the various objects and areas within a scene. Okay, so this is more about the light to me than it is about, you know, say an eagle. And I would say that's probably the case with uh, any scene that I'm doing. I'm trying to go for um, kind of the emotion of, uh, of a scene after I've stamped out the, uh, uh, the, composition, the composition and the various elements. So uh, usually going for an emotion within that uh, framework. And uh, I like the idea of soft light and uh, color box frost white and Q-tip are the is the tool that I generally use to kind of uh, create that uh, emotion or visual emotion, I guess, uh, within a scene in terms of uh, the diffusion of an image. And the light, you know, lightening it up on uh, certain areas. So, anyways, uh, hope you enjoy this uh, simple composition and scene. If you happen to watch the video, and uh, thanks again for tuning into the uh, channel. Okay, just a quick scene here today. Um, I want to have a moon. Um, kind of as a background, illuminating some trees, and uh, we'll have a eagle in silhouette flying in front of the moon for dramatic effect. And uh, what I was doing is I was trying to think of what color I want my impression to be in. Just the basics um, here is if I stamp out um, this moon in something fairly dark, if I want to have this um, silhouette in front of it, the darker I stamp this, the more kind of a dark image in front of it will tend to uh, kind of blend in uh, to the background. So that being said, um, you'll want to stamp out your image, background image, accordingly, you know, in terms of uh, whatever color you're using and uh, what value you use it in. I went with a dark blue here, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a Marvy brush marker, and this is a it's a manganese blue, but I think I re-inked it with a uh, um, a salvia blue, which is a light blue. Anyways, these brush markers here, they call the Marvy pads matchables because the colors of the pads match the pens, but they don't have all of their pens in pad form. So I didn't have a, a number 36 manganese blue to re-ink it with, so I just did it with another light blue and just recap. You just take the back off here and you can, you know, fill this in with uh, some re-inker fluid. So if, you know, if you don't have the color that you want, instead of just tossing your pen out, um, if the tip is still good, just re-ink it with some color that's close to it and uh, you should be able to get, you know, somewhat of a second life out of it. Okay, just uh, putting in some streaks of color. I like to color my image 
dark first, and then when I go in with the light, yeah, it might be picking up some of that color on the tip here, but uh, I like the way it blends in better than by working um, light to dark. If this is all stamped in a light color, and I put like a streak like this across it in a dark pen, when you stamp it out, you'd see that real distinct uh, dark uh, swipe. And I like it to, I don't know, transition um, a little bit more than uh, than uh, having that look, you know, real sharp um, marker lines within the image. Okay, um, when I do that, this type of blending, I really don't know what to expect. Sometimes I do all this coloring, I stamp it out, and oh my gosh, it's still, you know, all dark, um, it seems. So, don't know exactly what this will look like. Okay, now I'm taking this uh, paper towel, it's a dry paper towel, and I'm kind of wiping off some of the ink around the moon, and what that will hopefully do is it'll give that my impression um, kind of a softer, um, I guess, line uh, where the moon um, is defined by that uh, dark surrounding area there. And so hopefully it'll look kind of, a, it'll kind of push the illumination idea um, further. All right, now, uh, let's see, should I go center? I'll do this one centered. Um, I won't do kind of the, the rule of thirds on this one. Sometimes I do things kind of real centered uh, for dramatic effect. Okay, large stamps, of course, can get pressure across the surface. Okay. So you have that illumination around there. Okay, now I could take um, my cloud image and stamp it to the side here and take uh, the, uh, the textures of the clouds out to the side. Or I could just take this image right here again and use the sides of this, you know, for kind of a fill-in purpose. And I think I'm just going to do that. I think that's all that's really needed here. Okay. Inking it up in a similar fashion. Going with that memento, dark blue, putting in some streaks of a uh, this pen ink. What I think I'll do is I'll kind of wipe off some of the uh, perimeter here. And I'm not going to try to uh, blend in or match up edge to edge. Okay, I'm going to overlap a good quarter inch or so. And I find that uh, the seamless aspect of uh, you know, landscape stamping, scenic stamping um, works better that way when you approach it um, in terms of a overlap rather than kind of like a like a jigsaw puzzle where edges are matching up perfectly. When that happens, chances are the edges show a little bit more. When, when it's approached that way. And a lot of people kind of new to scenic stamping um, do just that because they're used to stamping with um, kind of outlined images as opposed to tonal ones, okay? All right, now I don't want too much of that dark point. Maybe I'll wipe some of that off a little bit. Okay. And we will overlap. It's about somewhere in between an eighth of an inch and a quarter inch of overlap between one impression to the next. Okay. 
I kind of went a little darker there. Now that doesn't match up perfectly, but it, it doesn't really matter because I'm going to be blending in a lot of tone around in that area. So not too big of a deal, but it gives us a little bit of um, texture off on the side that um, should uh, work nicely as a, as a foundation for the other inks to come. Okay, um, let's see. This is going to be uh, in blue tones. I'll take my Adirondack Light Aqua ink. Um, let me just use the cap here. For that pad. Get a little of this reinker fluid in there. And let me use a cleaner tip here. Okay. Take up all that ink in here. You can use a pad too. You can just, you know, dip into the pad and take it on here. I'm going to use a lot of this um, light tone though, so. Um, I just assume put the reinker fluid on here and make this almost like a ink pad, you know, on a stick. It's just easier to blend this around, uh, having a big, um, large amount of it on there just to begin with. It's easier to spread out. Well, I don't know if it's easier. It's just it's less time consuming than always having to dip, you know, and stamp, you know add, you know, whatever. Especially if I'm going for this amount of coverage, you know, it's it's almost got to cover the whole card. Now, be careful around your light sources. If you don't want to have your moon just completely dark, um, which one can do, you know, if that's what uh, effect you're going after. Um, but what I want is that moon to really look like it's the uh, the source of illumination um, within the scene. Okay. All right. Get a good amount of coverage. We're not just going for. Um, coloring, but we're going for somewhat of a, a saturation as well. We want the surface to be fairly thickly coated by the ink, meaning I want some of that ink to uh, kind of penetrate the surface and to kind of saturate the pulp of the paper a little bit so that the inks to come, which will be incrementally darker each time, will blend into the previous color um, a little bit easier by having, you know, this is not wet to the touch, but, you know, the pulp of the paper is starting to um, absorb, you know, a lot of that ink on there. So um, that's one of the biggest tips I can give in terms of using this technique. Okay, let's go up to a medium blue. Let's try this Bahama blue. Memento. It's real similar to the light blue by Marvy. Okay, and dye-based inks. Not the quick-drying ones like a, you know, like an alcohol or watercolor pad or something like that, but you want kind of, you know, regular dye-based ink um, for this process. You don't want something that's going to kind of set up, you know, a second after you lay it down, okay? So just regular dye-based inks right now, okay? Now I'm being real careful around my moon still. If I don't want that moon to just completely disappear, um, into the background in terms of making it dark, then just be careful about it, especially with the darker, you know, tones. 
you know, I could go over that moon a little bit with, um, you know, some of that lightest color, which was the aqua, and we'll still be able to see the moon, but, you know, when you start moving up into these darker tones, just, uh, you know, approach the, uh, the motion of your uh, application a little bit more, you know, uh, carefully. And uh, selectively, okay. And also, you know, I like to go for some variation, so you might want some of that lighter tone in there. So I might not touch certain areas, and uh, you know, this is going to give it more of a, a streaky kind of a look in terms of the oscillation of light and dark. We have light, you know, dark, light, dark. You can do that in these streaks as well. You don't have to have it just all one tone or something like that, okay? And that variation can potentially uh, add to the visual richness of a given composition. If you add, you know, if you get down, you know, through to the final step in um, your scene as far as coloring goes. If you ever want to go back and add more of a previous color, like, uh, you know, it's too white in there for me, or too light, you can always go back in and add more color, um, just right over the top of the darker ones, but just increase the amount of, you know, previous color. Um, so there's no point in, you know, no point uh, there isn't a point of no return, in other words. Okay, the mementos are fairly thick inks. They spread around nicely. And uh, the transitions are really easy. In other words, um, see, even if I go like this, it's a big blob right there, right? But the nature of the ink, the thickness of it, allows me to spread it around. And it also helps that I have that aqua down there. Uh, okay. So remember those lightest of colors um, quite often are the thing that makes the darker colors easier to apply um, in a nice smooth manner. Okay. Paper counts too. Um, this is a glossy cardstock. And um, having that coating on there, especially um, the glossy type, allows your inks to spread nicely because you have that uh, coating on the surface. So the inks aren't being absorbed into the uh, paper, um, you know, in a real quick manner. Okay. All right, let's move up into... Uh, dark blue, this is a dark, I'm not even sure what color this is, I, this, <laughs> this was used for a uh, magazine spread or something like that, and they marked it, let me see if I could tell, uh, I couldn't tell if it was the Prussian blue Marvy or if it was the just straight uh, color that they just call blue, you know, uh, which is a kind of a navy blue. Okay. Maybe this area around the moon, if there's all these clouds, maybe, you know, in nature, if we were looking at things visually, maybe it wouldn't get this dark on the uh, perimeter, but the, uh, in artwork, or whatever, unless we're working with some kind of illuminated medium like computer graphics or something like that, where things are going to be viewed on a, you know, an illuminated screen or something like that. When you're working on white paper, the thing that we're working with in terms of defining light is contrast, you know, through value. And uh, the brighter I want my moon to be, or to look in this scene, the darker I have to take the areas around it or somewhere within the scene. OK. 
Okay. Okay, that was uh, a number three blue. It's a navy blue. You can also use, also use the, uh, the original blue that the image was um, stamped out in. I like to have my um, four corners um, nice and dark as uh, not only a kind of a, a tool for illumination, but um, I like to uh, do it for framing. Kind of frames off the scene nicely. Unless I had, you know, some light source in the corner of one of these, you know, I wouldn't take it so dark. Um, but in this case, the uh, our light source is right in the middle of the card, so. Okay, going back to, um, or not going back to, but introducing black, okay. You know, it only gets so dark with the use of uh, colors. Um, in this kind of method of layering dye-based inks. And also um, what happens is the ink, the page, the, um, the paper starts getting really super saturated with ink at this point in time. Now, one could um, kind of wait for things to set up a little bit or use a, um, a heat heat gun or something like that, heat tool, to get the ink to set up a little bit more. So that way when you use your darker colors and apply them, you know, they'll stick to the paper a little bit easier. But um, I don't really like to do that. Um, I want these colors to blend in. And it's not so important to me that, uh, like, say, the... Uh, what I call is the tipping of the edges, going and coloring the tips of the, uh, you know, these corners right here in dark color. It, that's, I mean, this is dark enough for me for the most part, so I don't feel the need to, uh, to go in and, you know, allow this to set up and dry, you know, in order for it to get even darker. But if you wanted to, that's one way to do it, okay? Because what happens is the super saturation, it gets really soaked with ink, so that when you apply more over the top of it, you're going wet into wet, and sometimes it's almost like you're, uh, especially if you use a swiping motion, sometimes it's almost like you're removing ink because the, you know, the current ink that you're using with is more kind of floating on the surface right there. I streak it across, and it just, you know, it doesn't apply very um, quickly, um, which is the entire reason why you're, you know, uh, well, maybe not the entire reason, but a big part of the reason why you're going with so many layers. You don't want it to, um, you know, dry quickly. You want it to blend and spread. But like I said, when you move into the darker tones, sometimes, the, you know, it's hard to apply them. So anyways, um, I use more of a tapping motion, okay, than a swiping motion quite often at this stage of the game. Okay, there's our background there, and it almost looks like this could be an ocean down here too, you know? If I stamped a sailboat down here, that could easily be, um, you know, some body of water. But Let's go with um, some trees here. Um, I'm going to stamp these in black, because I want them to really stand out. And a nice bold silhouette. Maybe let's re-ink this pad a little bit here. Okay. Marvy Black. It's been my kind of go-to black um, pad over the years. Okay, now I could just stamp these trees 
you know, vertically, but I want to give this a little bit of perspective, you know, like things are going off into the distance, okay, perspective-wise, so I'm going to tilt this in a little bit, skew it, you might say. Okay, now, I want to stay clear of the area that I'm going to stamp my uh, bird in, eagle. So, you know, I'm going to put these kind of in the foreground here. So, I'm going to stay clear of this area. I don't know exactly where, um, you know, where and which eagle will go, or, you know, that I'll use, but um, I'll just be sure and give myself plenty of room for that decision. Okay, let's go a little bit lower here with some of these trees, just so it doesn't look so repetitive. Okay. And each time, I'm kind of, I'm not really pointing this at the moon, but uh, it's at that a little bit of an angle. Maybe the next one will be, you know, a little bit more vertical. Okay. And one more. Okay, so we have our row of trees here. Got some good illumination there. Um, yeah, I think that'll be enough. I'm trying to decide if I want to go even higher over here, but I think it would kind of make the composition a little bit of unbalanced if I did that, um, because things are somewhat symmetrical with that uh, kind of that center weighted composition. Okay, now looking at this, I'm this eagle is going to be too big. I want it to you know, be a little bit smaller, I think. If I did this, it would um, in terms of the relationship between the trees and this eagle, it would mean that this eagle, I think, is closer to the viewer's eye than the trees, okay, just in terms of the size relationship. So let's go smaller. I'll go with this, uh, I'll go with this other one. Okay. And I kind of have to decide what, uh, <laughs> where it'll go. Okay. I can just put them down here, but I, I think it'll be more dramatic if it kind of goes in front of the moon. Or a part of it. I have, to, I have to be careful down here. Those trees are really wet still. It's because of the re-inking and I was and the impression of those went over the top of a lot of uh, you know, layers of ink already, so uh, just be careful around in that area. Okay, that's pretty good in terms of the drama, I think. Definitely a focal point, though, huh? Um, okay, now, speaking of those trees, those trees are really damp, and I'm going to put on into the scene some additional texture in terms of uh, the softening of some clouds. I really want this to be a real textural statement in terms of um, kind of a depiction of soft light, you know. The scene could be about the eagle, but for me, in terms of the concept of what I wanted to do, I really wanted it to be more about the soft light. And having a nice crisp silhouette in front of that moon, will kind of uh, emphasize the softness 
of the light by having something crisp and dark in front of it in terms of a textural uh, contrast. So anyways, I'm going to let this set up a little bit and I'm going to wait for these trees to dry completely before I start adding in some things like the color box white pigment ink and uh, that'll probably be in about 10 minutes I'm guessing. Okay, it's been about a half an hour um, of letting this uh, card set up. It was really quite wet down here. There's even a couple specks down here in the trees that are still a little bit uh, kind of puddled as far as uh, uh, the pooling of uh, dark ink. Now, it usually won't do that. Um, I just happened to re-ink that uh, black pad right before stamping, so it was super um, juicy. As far as the ink content went on that pad, and then of course I'm stamping it into, you know, a fairly um, moist piece of uh, cardstock. So that's why it took a, you know, a while for it to, uh, for the ink to, uh, to dry, you know, in terms of evaporation and absorption as well. Okay, <clears throat> now that moon is already a little bit diffused around uh, the edges because I wiped off a lot of the ink before uh, even making the impression, but let's um, go into it and add a little bit more of this pigment. It looks like there's none, you know, nothing on the tip of this, but there's plenty of it, and I'm just tapping white into white right now. Uh, part of, uh, Part of the reason is just to remove some of the ink that's on there. Um, my pad is fairly old, but it's uh, <laughs> the one that I'm using right now is I haven't used it too much. So uh, that being said, it's uh, it's nice to know that uh, you can have some pads sit around for a long time, and uh, you know when you go use them, they're not dry. <clears throat> this is the color box frost uh, frost white okay frost white is a it's a good neutral white it's it's not it's kind of temperatureless you know some of the whites are going to be a little bit warm um, and some are going to be cool this one's good nice and neutral you can use it on uh, your warm uh, tone compositions, and you know, in addition to the uh, cooler uh, compositions. Okay, going around and looking at where I've retained some of the white of the card, you know, the original cardstock, and just going along the edge of where that white meets dark, and putting a very thin layer of this ink. It's kind of like you're dry stamping or dry tapping, or, you know. If you were painting, it would be called dry brushing. You have the right consistency of this ink. You know, this pigment ink on here. <clears throat> not all pigment inks are created the same. I'm not saying that anyone's better than another one, but this one happens to be one that doesn't dry very fast. There are pads out there that dry faster, and I use those as well, but I just don't use them for this purpose. Um, like a Brilliance pad, um, those ones are... Uh, it's a pigment ink that dries faster. Now sometimes what I'm doing is I, you know, I'm applying some of this other slow-drying one, and um, it gets to a point when I'm using it this way, in this manner, that um, I just can't apply anymore because, uh, you know, even if this ink kind of sets up on here a little bit and dries, um, the more, sometimes if I tap, try to tap more white over the top of it for the sake of opacity, making something lighter and whiter, um, it, I start removing some of it down there and that's when I would use like a Brilliance um, ink faster drying. I can tap it down and it'll stick to the page and dry faster. 
And uh, that's what I use those ones for um, in terms of this um, purpose. Okay, but right now I want to be able to manipulate what I've laid down if it's too light or too and it goes down in a blob. It's easy to um, remove it or alter it or, you know, fine-tune um, the look of the sink. Okay, trying to put some more vapor into these clouds. And in doing so, I'm adjusting the value of the cloud, making it lighter. <clears throat> Now this is white ink, but in the manner that I'm using it, um, it's more of a, a translucent layer of pigment ink. You can see the colors um, underneath it. Okay, as opposed to being opaque where you can't see it, you know, anything behind it. It meaning the uh, the layer of uh, the layer of ink. Okay, let's see. I'm going to come out here into the darker areas. Sometimes uh, when you move into the darker areas, if you use this kind of um, application of ink in the darker areas, it stands out and it looks kind of weird. But I do want to um, get a good amount of this ink down just for the sake of, you know, I really want this to look really airy and light in the background, soft. So uh, I'm probably going to use a little bit more than, you know, many of my uh, kind of moonlit nights. Okay. <clears throat> there was this cloud down here and I'm adding uh, some tone to that. Sometimes I add too much, you know, so I just I tap it off. You can see it's on my finger here. Um, like that. That's my kind of ink removal tool a lot of times. Just my finger. Um, one of the nice things about uh, color box pigments too is that even after this dries as well, if you don't like what you see, all you have to do is just, I don't know, you can just take a paper towel or something like that and just uh, wipe it right off and the ink uh, will come right off. That being said, if you really want um, kind of longevity as far as the uh, the ink um, adhering to the uh, paper I would do a you know light um, workable fixative or just a spray sealant over the top of it but you have to be very careful that you don't put you know spray it too in a thick um, coating otherwise you'll all of this uh, white pigment ink work will kind of disappear. It's almost like um, spraying chalks or pastels, if you know what I mean, if you've ever worked with those. And if you've sprayed it, you know, to seal everything off, a lot of times the lightest of things, if you put light over dark, we lose that, uh, that touch because the lighter things over the top of the darker things, it kind of turns it from something semi-opaque to almost transparent where the darker, you know, all you see is dark and that's what would happen um, with this pigment ink. So all you do is you just kind of give it a, some lighter coat spray, you know, from a distance, don't spray too close and just kind of lightly <clears throat> coat the uh, surface with that spray and you can do it a couple times to where it's really sealed off very well, you know, um, the uh, pigment ink work um, is protected, and then what you can do 
because it has those spray coat seal sealants on there in light coatings. You can go over it with a thicker coat if you want to, just to make the whole thing seem a little bit glossier or whatnot, shiny, if that's uh, the look you're going after. Okay, we have this little area down here. I've re you know, those streaks of light down there have been created with the streaks of darkness. Let's go in here and add a little bit of uh, a vapor type of effect. Now, I've done a lot of tappings with this so far, um, and I think I've only inked it up once after that initial uh, inking. So this is the second inking, and I'm still utilizing what's on this tip right here. Naturally, my, <clears throat> my pad was fairly new, like I said, but uh, what I'm getting at is, you know, the ink that you have on your swab here tends to go a long way. You know, we're not using a lot of it. We're just putting kind of a very thin layer of it onto the uh, onto the scene. Okay, now I'm putting some of this down in this lighter area, that light streak down here, but I'm kind of running some of it into the uh, the trees down here as well. And uh, when you put that little bit of pigment ink over the top of a you know a tree branch or dark object. Um, what it can look like because of that translucent appearance. It looks like, um, it can look like light is hitting those trees right there and then you're introducing kind of a variation of value into the scene. And, um, and uh, the representation of light, okay? Now I couldn't really, I don't think I can illuminate these branches over here without being super, super careful. Maybe I'll try it, but it's easier to do it where light meets dark, okay? Because I can put a big swatch of white in there and it's not really going to matter. But where it kind of creeps over into the branches, that's where that look takes place. But if I put, you know, white over here, um, you know, there stands a chance of it looking rather blobby because it's so dark in the background and that little application of white will stand out more <clears throat> due to the contrast of the uh, of the area but I don't know well we'll see let's see what let's see what I can do okay so kind of a light touch here Okay, yeah. Doesn't look that great over here, but let's try it in this really dark area and see if we can get a little bit of a illumination going. Eh, I don't know. It's a... Okay, I guess see that little bit right there. I'm going to leave it like that, though. See, I'm using more white in the lighter areas. And this one over here, I just put a little touch of it over the top of that. Um, I don't know if it looks good or not, but it's so little that it really doesn't matter too much. Okay. It's illuminating some of these trees directly under the moon. Okay, just a uh, little tip here. Um, the moon is uh, centrally located, so on the left side of the tree, on the right side of the paper, we have the illumination, and the trees off to the left are right side illuminated, and the trees right here are just kind of top lit. You don't have to do one side or the other. Doesn't mean that you can't put some highlights over here, you know, I mean, that that moonlight was coming over here, but kind of having it more heavily uh, illuminated on the left side kind of reinforces the uh, the direction of light 
um, within a scene. So here we go right here. I'll maybe I'll put a little bit of illumination on a couple of these uh, bows here. Okay, so we have that going kind of right there. Right. Looking at it from a distance, you know, you can see what it, uh, how it's affecting the tree. So anyways, um, <clears throat> light source and reflected light. So you have that kind of dialogue going on um, within the scene. So it's kind of like a visual dialogue. One of the things that um, people, you know, that have kind of struggled with the idea of lighting um, in scenes, uh, the solution is <clears throat> a pretty easy one for, uh, I guess, this um, area of difficulty that they've run into, but where they run into um, the most amount of difficulty, as far as the comments that I've had over the years, is just the simple retention of light areas within a scene. In other words, just um, slowing down in the application of the medium tones to darker tones, because what happens is a lot of times on a scene like this, you have this something like a moon stamped out, and it's the encroachment of the darker tones into the middle here, so you might have that moon nice and bright, but then it's just dark, you know, immediately afterwards, and they have troubles with that transition right there, so just remember that the lighter colors kind of go, you know, get the closest to the uh, source of light, and then as you get darker, you use less ink, and you get less coverage with it, so you have that transition from light to dark, wherever your um, light sources might be. Okay, um... <clears throat> That's the addition of the light, or soft um, lighting within the scene. Let's kind of zoom down a little bit here. And let's go with the crisp application of um, light. And we'll do it the same way. We'll have, um, this is the white uh, gel pen. This one's a Pilot Shoes. I also love the Uniball Signo, but a little bit of highlight on the top surfaces of things. If the light, if the sur if the object is under the source of light, okay. So on the tops of my clouds, on the portion of objects facing the light, on the side facing that light, they get a little bit of a treatment of white dots, okay, there, see that, you can see it right on the tip there, right throughout here, <clears throat> okay, but what I was getting at, talking about objects under the uh, light source will get top illuminated. Let's say there's these, uh, well, these clouds, not say there is, but there are, um, these ones will be bottom lit because the source of light is coming from below them, so we'll put a few highlights on the bottom side, and again, this is kind of reinforcing that idea of light, right? Um, if I had an object, you know, right here, like say my finger was a branch, I would illuminate this side of the finger, and if I had a finger right here, illuminate that side. The closer I am to the light source, the more dots you get. The farther away and in the darkness, the less dots you use, okay? That's just kind of a general approach that I, I do. Um, and it makes it a little bit easier to do. Now, if you're ever worried or 
kind of concerned, you know, when using this pen because these little dots can really stand out sometimes. My recommendation is just to uh, try it out. I mean, it can really be very, very effective in terms of the look. My recommendation is just keep it sparse, you know, and it'll never look obtrusive if you just do a little bit. See that right there? There's just a few little dots against this dark background, so those dots stand out more than the dots right in here because it's light against light. But when looking at it like this from arm's distance, those few little dots, you know, if you just put five or something like that, it should be fine, you know, it's just a subtle um, addition to the lighting scheme of a scene. And uh, it adds some great texture to a scene. And uh, if you do it kind of in a a very sparse um, application, okay, it looks funny in one little object, but the thing is, is if you add that texture over uh, consistently over all of the objects that might have a highlight in it, okay, um, it won't stand out as something that looks odd. It'll look integral as far as the look of the scene, okay? So you have this on these trees right here. See, there's just a couple little applications of it over here, more on the uh, the right side, okay? Just moving it across in here. Okay, there we go. So there's a bunch of dots, and then you Hold it out at a distance, okay? It just, everything kind of blends in nicely. Um, and it makes sense as far as um, um, highlights. I mean, I can hold this pad here, and that little highlight down there is there. Oops. <laughs> and you see that little flash of light right there? That's, you know, and I, I have my lights coming, like, you know, from. I have one over here and one over here, and see how it's highlighting this part where it's facing that light, and this part of the pad is facing that. Now this is just a clear thing, but you know we can almost put anything down here. Well, maybe not that. Okay, well here's a little bit of reflection right there, you know, in the area that's facing that. Here's my pen right here, you know. Here's that little white, what would be used if I was drawing that little streak of light like that, or that here's that little highlight on my pen right there, okay? And it's, of course it's on coming from the top side of it, so you can see these highlights are all around. Um, you know, you can kind of just use your objects as like a, you know, reference point on um, where they might look good. You know, just take a look at the objects around you and see, you know, how much of a highlight is on them, chances are, uh, you know, at your drawing table, you probably have a light that you're working with, um, you know, over the top of your desk or wherever you're working, dining room table sometimes, maybe you have a chandelier or something like that with several lights on it. But just take a look at your pads and everything like that and you'll see where this um, reflected light um, is just over everything. You know, if you're eating dinner, it's on your silverware, you know, be it, you know, metal, stainless steel, or whatever. could be plastic. could be a piece of black plastic, and it'll still have that highlight. And that's what these little touches are adding into it. Okay? All right. <clears throat> have some little highlights up there in those clouds. Okay, and it's kind of subtle. I have it, you know, if you look at this kind of a person, then, uh, well, let me see. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. Here's some highlights on the bottom side of here. I have a little bit up here. Okay, some down in here, and see that right over there? Those little highlights. The, they're just subtle if you look at it from, you know, a distance. Then you bring it in, 
and those highlights are a little bit more apparent and those little details kind of can really add up and bring kind of a feeling of life into these otherwise, you know, kind of duller areas of the scene, you know, where nothing's really going on too much, but you put a little of those sparkly highlights in there and it's like you're adding light uh, into that, uh, those um, areas or that space. Okay. So I'd recommend giving it a try if you haven't before. Um, if this is a blue scene, you can even use something like a silver or something like that. Uh, pen, silver, and blue looks really good. Okay, anyways, um, full moon eagle. A lot of texture in the background, very simple composition using um, three different stamps. One of them used in uh, I don't know, maybe to make, what was that, four or five different impressions. One moon with the impressions of the side of it being used to fill in some space. And uh, a lot of pigment ink, a lot of application of pigment ink in a very thin uh, manner. And uh, to finalize things, putting in the uh, gel pen highlights. Okay, anyways, hope you enjoyed the scene, and thanks for watching.